Okay, so um, I'm going to play this banjo. It has uh, some pre-war parts in it, which makes it sound like a pre-war, because it is a pre-war in a sense. And uh, so let me play it, and then we can explain it. <laughs> this banjo here. So the uh, most common things that cause the play pre-war sound are three things, the rim, the resonator, and, and a pre-war tone ring, okay? Now a pre-war tone ring, of course, if you find a real one, and I know people are going to, after I say this, you're going to be running all over the place thinking that you have a pre-war tone ring. Uh, and the problem is that a pre-war tone ring will bring, you know, close to thirty thousand dollars. Okay, because when you put it on a pre-war banjo, it it becomes transformative. So if you've got a tone ring in your garage and it just happens to uh, you think it looks old, that tone ring's either worth about four hundred dollars or it's worth about thirty thousand. There's nothing in between. Okay, and. Uh, if you think you have a pre-war tone ring, call Steve Huber. He's the only person that I would trust if you found an orphan ring. An orphan ring is a ring that you don't know where it came from, okay? He's the only guy that I would trust to authenticate an or orphan ring. Why am I saying that? I'm just saying that you can get very close to that sound if you have the resonator, the shell, and a good quality tone ring. So... Uh, let's look at this banjo. So the first thing that happens is whoever did it decided he wanted a gold Granada type banjo. So he went to Steve Huber and had him engrave parts. Steve didn't do it, but he had somebody else do it and repl and plate the parts. Okay. Now there are two people in the country that do a really good job of gold plating, and Steve Huber is one of those. And I don't know who the other guy is. Anyway, so the gold is magnificent. Then, uh, let's talk about the resonator for a second. So, he took a resonator that was plain, okay, and he, okay, so, so what happens, all resonators are poplar, okay, so this wood here is poplar, this wood on the sides is poplar, and on the outside you have a veneer. So this originally had a plain maple veneer. So the owner decided he wanted to have a Granada look, so he put a thin layer of curly maple on this, okay? So this resonator retains the sound, okay? Which is the whole point if you want a pre-war sound. The second thing he did, he took what was called a shoe lug rim, which is a three-ply hard rock maple rim, and he had it cut down and put a tone ring in it. Now, here's what that rim looks like. And the rim, 
what Shulag meant is that they had a Shulag looking bracket that uh, held the uh, nuts and hooks in place. Okay, now you can see when you look at the shell that there are holes where the shoe lugs went. Okay, so these holes, to be honest with you, this uh, shell doesn't look that great, but it doesn't matter. In other words, it is magic what it does. So the person who owned it wanted to have that three-ply hard rock maple shell that would be five eighths inch thick, okay? He wanted to have an original resonator, which this is. These are the tone producing elements. And he wanted, but he wanted it to look really good from the outside. So he went ahead and put some uh, extra veneer on this and he gold plated the rest of the nickel parts. And he had Arthur Hatfield, who's a great neck builder, build this neck. And the neck happens to be mahogany, okay? And a mahogany neck on a Granada really gives you an incredible sound. And then you can see the, the maple on the back here. So, long story short, if you were to get a real Granada, and it didn't have an original flathead tone ring in it because it had a raised head. And you put, and you bought that banjo, okay? If the banjo was in this condition, you would have to pay about $25,000 for it, okay? So instead of paying $25,000, you can pay a mere fraction of that and get something that is very similar to it and actually probably looks better, you know, because the uh, gold hasn't worn off. So we will start having banjos come in like this. We're going to sell them relatively cheaply. Uh, we're not going to try to get the big price, and uh, but we'll go through and we'll authenticate everything and tell you exactly what the banjos com comprised of. So normally what happens with something like this is we'll sell the banjo for about what the parts are worth, okay? And that's basically it, because if this were a Gibson banjo, you'd be looking at at least twice as much money. So that's it. So uh, you'll see some pictures of this on our banjowarehouse.com site. And if you have any questions, just ask us, and we'll be glad to answer those questions. And if you want to come and visit us, we've got about 100 to 110 banjos in stock at all times. And uh, give us a day's notice if you're driving up or flying in. In fact, we have some guy flying in tomorrow, I believe. Uh, he's going to fly in, and uh, hopefully his arms don't get tired. <laughs> That's terrible. Um, anyway, and if you want to talk about pre-wars and stuff and want me to be there, give me two days notice because it takes about four hours to explain the differences and to show you how to apply it to get the maximum optimum sound out of it. Well, that's it. So you guys have a great day and we'll look forward to seeing you later.